thanks for the opportunity to show our work here. And today I'll talk about the today I'll talk about the coronal magnetism, the spectral polarimetric diagnostics from infrared to ultraviolet. So as we all know that the solar eruptions such as flares and the associated solar particle events and also the coronal mass ejections will cause uh, as the main cause of the space weather uh, and the high speed streams such as the uh, fast solar wind also uh, can cause the geomagnetic storm on the earth so uh, to understand and predict these phenomena it is very important to mirror the chronomagnetic field. And this is the outline of my talk. So first I'll introduce the multi-wavelength diagnostics from radio to infrared wavelengths uh, to uh, mirror the chronomagnetic field. And then I show the resonance scattering and the handler effect in infrared and ultraviolet wavelengths. And then I will also show some forward modeling result on the solar wind and its anisotropic effect. And at last, I'll give my conclusions. So we start from here. And uh, uh, we can mirror the chronomagnetic field through radio wavelengths. There are two mechanisms. The first one is free free emission, which is produced by the thermal bromstrola. It can give us the line of sight magnetic field. And this this image, the, okay, the left image shows the forward modeling result uh, from PSI MHD model, and the red and blue shows the positive and negative line of sight magnetic field. And the other mechanism is from geo resonance emission. It can give us the exosurface of the absolute. Uh, value of the magnetic field. And the red image is from Lee 2007. Uh, the orange sphere is the uh, optical image of the sun. And the black lens shows the magnetic field from extrapolation. And the layers with different colors show the radio emission layers with different frequency. And this layer can be used to uh, diagnose the exosurface of the magnetic field. And the uh, telescope for the radio at current and in the future are uh, as follows, shown on the left, on the right. And we can also uh, mirror the chronomagnetic field through infrared wavelengths. There are two ways. One way is from Zeeman splitting, uh, which is very well known to uh, get the line of sight magnetic field. Uh, the left image shows the, uh, uh, shows the line of sight magnetic field in the solar chrono. This is from Lin Haosheng 2004. And this is the first and the only measurement of the line of sight magnetic field from observation. Um, we can also get the plan of sky magnetic field through MHD waves. And the video shows the Doppler velocity variation from COMP. So the variation of the Doppler velocity, we can get the information uh, for the MHD waves and then the B plan of sky. And more information can be found in, in the right two papers. And the telescope for infrared observation at current and in, and in the future uh, as these. And then I will talk about the resonance scattering and the handler effect in infrared and uh, ultraviolet. So the chronon ions, the chronon ions, uh, like shown in the Arrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the mouse is missing. Oh, it's fine. Okay. 
I think I can stand here, yeah. So the chrono elms uh, can scatter the instant radiation from the lower solar atmosphere and uh, produce linear pol polarized light on the plane, which is perpendicular to the lamp side. Uh, so in the following study, we assume the instant radiation is unpolarized and cylindrical symmetric. Uh, and we also assume the coronal ions are two level atom and with unpolarized lower level. So first we show the result in UV wavelengths, which is usually approximated as electric dipole transition. Uh, so on the left is the linear polarization in lemma alpha with radio of zero magnetic field. The background is the linear polarization fraction and the blue line segment shows the azimuth. Thank you. Okay. So the linear polarization fraction is defined here. Uh, it is increasing with hat since uh, the instant radiation, the anisotropy of the instant radiation is in increasing with the hat. Uh, as, the, as we move away from the sun, the sun will be more point-like, and hence the anisotropy of the instant uh, radiation is increasing. The so azimuth, which is the direction of the linear polarization, is parallel to the solar limb because we assume the instant radiation is cylindrical symmetric. And then we show the result in infrared. Uh, the background is also the linear polarization fraction and the uh, a blue line segment has the azimuth. So the linear polarization fraction is also increasing with height. Uh, it is the same reason as in UV. But the azimuth is perpendicular to the solar limb, which is because the IR lines are usually approximated as magnetic double transition. So there are 90 degree difference between uh, in the atmos between the IR and the UV. So from the above, we find if the instant radiation is unpolarized on the, li on the left, the resonant scattering uh, uh, and the zero magnetic field condition, radio magnetic, magnetic condition, the resonant scattering will, will produce linear polarization either parallel or perpendicular to the solar limb but with non-radio magnetic field as shown here, the direction of the linear polarization will rotate and the magnitude of the linear polarization will decrease. So this is a very famous effect called Heller effect. To study the Heller effect quantitatively, we uh, adopt the geometry from Cassini to Son 2. In this geometry, the direction of the lamp site and local solar vertical and the vector magnetic field is defined, as well as the reference here, reference direction of linear polarization. Um, if we make a simple assumption that the reference direction of the linear polarization is along the local solar vertical and the lamp site is towards observer, then the Heller effect scattering matrix can be simplified. And if we assume the uh, explicit direction of the magnetic field, such as in the plane of sky or along the site, the scattering matrix will be further simplified as follows. So this is the uh, emission coefficient of the Stokes profile with pure B plan of sky. And this is the emission coefficient uh, of Stokes profile with pure B lamp side. The gamma in these equations are proportional to the lamma frequency omega B, which is depends on the magnetic field strength. So 
the, the, in these equations, the terms with gamma shows the handler effect dependent on the magnetic field strength. And we also see the term CB, which is the angle between the uh, magnetic field and local solar vertical. So the terms with this parameter shows the handler effect dependent on the geometry of the magnetic field. Uh, for the B plus sky case, if gamma is on the order of one, uh, which is also the lambda frequency omega b times the left term of the upper level of the transition is around the order of one, then the emission coefficient of the Stokes profile will be will depends both on the magnitude and the geometry of the magnetic field. This is the handler effect in saturated re in unsaturated regime. But if the gamma is much greater than one, where the omega b times tau is much greater than one, then the emission coefficient only depends on the geometry, which is uh, Cb. This is the handler effect in saturated regime. And then I will show the forward modeling of this of this handler effect in different regime. First, I introduce the magnetohydrostatic model that we use in this study. It is from Lo Hansen, 1995. It is the flat slope model, uh, and the magnetic field is shown here. The left one is the lump side component of the magnetic field, and the right shows the plus sky component of the magnetic field. So the flat slope in the flat slope region, there are both B plus sky and B lump side. But outside the flat slope, there's no B lump side. There's only B plus sky. And the magnetic field is skewed by the external dipole field here. The lower two panels shows the density and the thermal pressure distribution. They have similar distribution because we assume the temperature is isothermal. And it is around 1.5 times 10 to the 6 Kelvin. Uh, in the flat slope region, we do not have uh, prominence plasma and the and, and can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, maybe just a little higher up on your collar. Okay. Maybe on the other side. On the other side. Yeah, other side because this one? you're facing the screen. Sorry? I'm asking the equation of state in this solution is an ideal gas. Uh it's it is in Yeah. Yeah, hydro hydrogen gas, yes. Uh so where I am? Okay. So the uh, Lorentz force is balanced. Okay, this is much better. The Lorentz force is balanced by the thermal pressure and the gravity. And uh, the model is cylindrical symmetric. Uh, so why we use this model? Because uh, in this model, it can split in the magnetic field in lamp side and plus sky. So we can build an insight into how the diagnosis can probe the magnetic field strength and direction. And here is our result. First uh, is the result in infrared wavelengths, which is in the saturated regime of Henry effect. Uh, as we mentioned before, if the magnetic field is pure plus sky, the, uh, the emission coefficient of the Stokes profile can be simplified. And then the linear polarization fraction, which is L over I, have a, have, has an 
expression like this. It only depends on the geometry of the magnetic field, but not the magnetic field strength. And uh, if this term equals zero, where the C to be equal 54.7 degree, then the L over I will be zero. This is the so-called wavelength angle. And uh, we can find these features on the left image. This one shows the linear polarization uh, in uh, 10747. And the background is the linear polarization fraction. The white arrow shows the B plus sky direction. So there's black ears here and here, where the B plus sky cross the wavelength angle and uh, have, have the linear polarization fraction, which is produced by the resonance scattering, equals zero. We also see the LRI equals zero at this, uh, and at, at here and here. This is because the angle between the vector magnetic field and the local solar vertical is equal to the wavelength angle. And we will show the region of the flux rope later. And then we overlay the Stokes, uh, uh, sorry, then we overlay the atmos on the previous image. And the atmos is shown as a green line segment here. So if the angle between the B plus sky and local solar vertical is greater than the wavelength angle, then the azimuth is perpendicular to the B plus sky. And at other places, like here and here, where the angle between the B plus sky and the local solar vertical is smaller than the wavelength angle, then the uh, azimuth uh, will be the same direction as the B plus sky. This uh, is consistent with the simplified expression of azimuth when we only have B plus sky in the saturated regime of the Henry effect. And this is a zoom in of the flash rope region. The background is the L over I and the uh, white arrow and green line segment shows the skewed uh, B plus sky and azimuth. So the L over I is very small in this fast region because there is low side component of the magnetic field. And at the center of the flat slope where the magnetic field is exactly along the off side, the linear polarization fraction is exactly equal to zero. And this is also consistent, consistent with the a uh, simplified case uh, where there is pure B long side. Uh, in the previous slide, we only showed the result on the plum sky. Uh, so here we show the result when we do the integration along long side. This is a forward modeling result and from the flash through model here. And we see the wavelength uh, polarization node is still exist and the azimuth is either perpendicular or parallel to the B plus sky. And this one shows the observation from COMP. Uh, they look similar as the forward modeling result. So, uh, we can say that the saturated halo regime in IR wavelengths can be used to diagnose the configuration of the magnetic field. It is also approved in the pseudo streamer. Uh, this is our forward modeling result uh, from the pseudo streamer model, and uh, there is no point in the linear polarization fraction, which is correspond to the new point of the magnetic field. And this is also consistent with the observation from COMP. But from the saturated regime of Henry effect, we can only obtain the topology of the magnetic field. So if we want to diagnose the strength of the magnetic field, 
we need to turn to unsaturated Hanley regime, which is shown here. Uh, so the left is still the flash rope that we use here. The background, uh, the blue, shows the below side, and the right arrow shows the B-plus sky. And the right is our forward modeling result. Uh, the background is A over I, and the green line segment shows the azimuth. From left to right, the magnetic field stress is increasing. So we see the linear polarization fraction is decreasing with the increasing magnetic field in the flux region, and also here and here. And the azimuth as shown as a green line segment, is increasing with the increasing magnetic field. It can also find here where the background is uh, azimuth, and the black line, black line arrow shows the b plus sky. So the azimuth is increasing. If we focus on the regions outside the flat slope, we see with the increase in B-plus sky, the azimuth is also increasing, but only proportional to the extent that B-plus sky is non-radial. Uh, and uh, if the magnetic field is very strong, the van Leck polarization node starts to appear like this. Then we choose a point at the center of the flat slope to show the result quantitatively. Uh, the linear polarization and azimuth is shown here. So in this case, there is only B-line side. Uh, the dash line, the dash line shows azimuth, and the dash dotted line shows the linear polarization fraction. The right color shows the result for oxygen 60, and the blue color shows the result for lemma alpha. Uh, so the tendency of the evolution along the, uh, when the magnetic field is increasing, is uh, decreasing for the A over I and increasing for the azimuth. So uh, this is consistent with the simplified expression when there is pure below side, since the uh, L over I and azimuth will only depend on the gamma, which is depends on the magnetic field strength. So uh, the below side can be quantified by linear polarization through Handler effect in unsaturated regime. And if we compare these two lines which shows the uh, linear polarization fraction in oxygen 6 in red and in lemma alpha in blue. The, this one is decreasing much faster than this one, which means the ox oxygen 6 is more sensitive to the handler effect. So until now, we only consider the radiative component of the resonant scattering, but there is also collisional component. So if we take into the collisional component, the result is shown here. This one is the same as previous one without collisions. So if we compare these two panels, we see the azimuth here and here, it doesn't change. This is because the collision will only increase the unpolarized intensity, but not the polarized part. And if we see the linear polarization fraction here, the blue curve, which is for lemma alpha, doesn't change much, but the red, red line, which is for oxygen 6, is decreasing much severe. So it means the collision contribute more to the oxygen six line. This is only one point. And then we show the result in 2D. The left two is for lemma alpha, and the right two panels is for oxygen six. 
So this one and this one is without collisions, and these two are with collisions. There are no difference in these two panels. But if we see the result in oxygen 6, the linear polarization produced by the resonance scattering is almost again, if we consider the collisions. Uh, so I, need, uh, I forgot to mention the collision is uh, the, the, it's between the electron and the coronal ions. So this is because the relative component is contributing uh, more to the lemma alpha line, and the collisional component contributes more to the oxygen 6 line. Then we defined a parameter which is called required signal to noise ratio as 3 over AZ over L over I to get a 3 sigma confidence on the obtained azimuth. And to show no result uh, in this panel, the left two are for lemma alpha and the right two are for oxygen 6 with, uh, without or with collisions. So the darker means the required signal to noise ratio is low, which is good. Uh, so you will see these two panels. The, the uh, required signal to noise ratio is low in the flustered region. And uh, if we compare these two, the value seems to be even smaller in oxygen 6 than in lemma alpha. But if we, if we uh, compare the result with collisions here, the required signal to noise ratio in the fast region in oxygen 6 is much higher when there is collision component. So the lemma alpha is better line for diagnosing the chronomagnetic field compared to the oxygen 6. Uh, we can also saturate the UV lens when we set a extremely large magnetic field, such as one sound Gauss shown here, then the UV lens will also be the, in the saturated regime of Hanner effect. And we show the forward modeling result here. This is the linear polarization fraction. The, back, the background is LI, and uh, the green line segment is uh, azimuth. This one shows uh, this one background is azimuth, and the black line segment shows the B plus sky direction. Uh, we see the van length polarization nodes when the UV line is saturated, and we see the uh, azimuth is either parallel or perpendicular to the B plus sky when UV is saturated. The azimuth information can also be obtained from here. And then we give a movie, show the transition from unsaturated halo regime to saturated halo regime in UV lines. So the background is L over I, and the uh, green line segment is the azimuth. The van length polarization node is, uh, start to appear when the magnetic field is extremely large and when it is in the saturated regime. And this one shows the transition for the azimuth. When it is saturated, the azimuth in this part is parallel to the B plus guy. And the azimuth here and here is perpendicular to the B plus guy. Let me show the result for UV lens and IR lens, both in the saturated halo regime. And the uh, uh, background is L over I, and green line segment is the uh, azimuth. So the van length polarization node is similar in these two lines when they are both in saturated halo regime. And the azimuth uh, is either parallel or perpendicular to the B plus guy. But if you compare these two, they have, the azimuths have 90 degree flip for these two lines when this 
when the B plus sky when the azimuth is parallel to the B plus sky in UV lens, the azimuth uh, will be perpendicular to the B plus sky in IR lens. Next, I'll show our forward modeling result with solar wind and the anisotropic effect. Uh, first, I'll show a sketch for the resonant scattering polarization. The yellow cap is the sun, and the uh, red and blue curve shows the land profile of the instant radiation from different direction, and the line curve shows the land profile of the coronal ions. The red arrow is the linear polarization from this direction, and the green arrow is the uh, linear polarization from this direction. And the uh, blue arrow is the integral, uh, integral uh, through all the solid angle that is subtended by the instant radiation. Uh, in this case, we have zero velocity. Uh, we have zero velocity or radio velocity. Then the uh, resonant scattering will be symmetric uh, for this coronal ions, and the linear polarization uh, is parallel to the solar limb if it is a E transition case. If we have non-radio uh, solar wind velocity, then the land profile of the coronal ions in this direction will be shifted, uh, which makes the resonant scattering be asymmetric. And the linear polarization after integration will rotate. If we consider the solar wind and isotropic effect, the, re the result is shown here. The solar wind and isotropic is the uh, phenomenon that the temperature is different along the magnetic field and uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field. And the land profile in the perpendicular direction is much broader than the one that is parallel to the magnetic field. Uh, so, again, the resonance scattering will be asymmetric and the linear polarization will rotate. If we compare this blue arrow and the previous blue arrow, we find they rotate in different direction. So the uh, Doppler dimming if non radio Doppler dimming effect and the solar wind and isotropy effect works in different, in opposite way on the linear polarization. And as discovered by UVCS, that the solar wind is anisotropic, so these two effects will happen together. And the uh, integral uh, linear polarization uh, will rotate, depends on the combination result of these two effects. Then I show the forward modeling result for the above effect. The model that we use here is a magnetohydrostatic model, uh, which is a streamer from Gibson, Bechno, and Lowe, 1996. Uh, the, it, it is a depot field uh, in the solar corona, and uh, the magnetic field is in the plus sky, so there is only B plus sky. There is no B love side, and uh, the streamer is uh, close re in the close region, and uh, uh, there is open field region in the chrono. This is a velocity map, where we only uh, add velocity in the open field region, and the velocity is adopted from Kramer 1999, and this one is. Uh, this velocity is an uh, empirical model from UVCS observation. The lower two panels shows the density and temp and the pressure. This is this uh, this is also from the empirical model. 
uh, and uh, the density and pressure are fixed. But we can still change the magnetic field in the closed region and in the open region, as long as we keep the jump of the magnetic pressure is balanced by the thermal, the jump of the thermal pressure. So there's current, there's current uh, at the boundary of the streamer, but there's no Lorentz force. And this is also a cylindrical symmetric model. Uh, first, I show the result for pure Handler effect uh, with this model. This again shows the magnetic field. The background is a B plus sky. And the red arrow shows the direction of the B plus sky. So it's like here, there's a, there's a dipole field here. Uh, the red panels show the Handler effect with different magnetic field strengths. Uh, so the asmos, the background is asmos, and the black lens shows the B plus sky. Uh, with increasing magnetic field, the asmos is increasing, as we mentioned before. When the magnetic field is large, then we see there's wavelength, length, there's van length uh, angle here, which uh, uh, we have the 90 degree flip of the atmos. It is, it is a little bit faint. This is right, this is blue, and this is blue, this is right. Here is the flip of the atmos. And then I show the Doppler dimming effect and solar wind and isotropy in this slide. Uh, on the left, I show the solar wind velocity along the solar radius and the solar wind and isotropy here in the blue line. And the, this panel shows the atmos with only Doppler dimming effect, and this panel shows the atmos with only solar wind and isotropy. If we look at the same location as these two panels like here, we see the linear polarization direction is rotating in opposite direction. Since this is blue, this is right, so they are rotating in different direction. It means this two effect is working on the linear polarization in opposite way, which uh, we have shown in the sketch. And if we put these two effects together, this is the result. Uh, it means that the two effects are not added linearly, since if they are linearly added, they should be smaller than either of them. But we see the result of the asmos is similar to the case of Doppler dimming effect, but it is strengthened by the anisotropic effect. And at last, we show all the effects that we mentioned in this presentation. That includes the Heller effect, Doppler dimming effect, and solar wind and isotropic effect. And show the result here. The background is the atmos, and the black line shows the B plus sky. So this is uh, the Doppler dimming and Halley effect. This is a solar wind and s with Halley effect, and this is the both effect with Halley. Uh, from this panel, we can tell that the Halley effect and the other two effects are working at different regions of the solar corona. Since the Halley effect is sensitive to the, to, to the magnetic field, so in the outer region, the magnetic field is very weak. So the Halley effect is dominant at lower latitude of corona, solar corona. Uh, and the other two effects dominate at higher latitude of the solar corona, which is good since they are easy to identify it separately. And then I will give my conclusions here. So the linear polarization of ultraviolet and infrared lines can be used complementary to diagnose the magnetic field in the solar corona. Since the UV is in the uh, unsaturated Hanley regime, which gives the strength and uh, direction, 
and L is in the unsat in the saturated hand regime, which only gives the direction. And when the magnetic field is along the upside, the magnetic field magnitude can be quantified from the linear polarization through the unsaturated hand regime. And uh, hand effect and solar wind dominate at different uh, regions in the solar cone. And the uh, Doppler dimming effect and linear polarization is strengthened by the anisotropic effect from our case study. So that, that's it. So uh, I have an old picture that Jack Harvey took uh, in, in some centuries ago, where one can, it's a picture in linear polarization uh, of a piece of the solar limb, and one can see where the magnetic fields are, that the polarization is uh, reduced there, and that, that's the essence of the Hanley effect. And you've shown us now, uh, beautifully worked out uh, uh, mathematical formulation on uh, how this Hanley effect quantitatively really works and for these different uh, magnetic configurations that, that are given in some uh, Given solutions, you have uh, worked out these configurations, and then you worked in the uh, solar wind. Uh, and while one would have expected that uh, with more complicated structures and including these effects, it's all going to be uh, a total mess. Uh, you claim it's actually uh, uh, quite pronounced. So to me, then the follow-up question would be, given that this is so promising, what kind of a field of view will one need to have to actually see something, uh, see a real structure, and uh, what uh, what will be in an actual observation the uh, how long do you have to uh, integrate and things like that 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 will be the next steps yes in order to then get an idea which of the existing or future telescopes uh, can get to this and uh, but uh, it, it's uh, I think it's a wonderful piece of work yeah so for the field of view question I think this image maybe can give some information mm. okay so this is uh, 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 asmos that with the magnetic field strength like 50 gauss this is too much for the coronal magnetic field so it should be much fainter than this one. Yeah. So this one is, you can still diagnose something like at two solar radius. So it, it should be lower than two solar radius for the Heller effect. And for your question about the instrument aspect, uh, we haven't done that yet, but we are planning to do it mm -hmm. to see the requirement for the instrument. Great. Mm -hmm. Just a, a simple question. When you are modeling the polarization, it sounds like you have to account for many different rays coming from different angles from the sun's surface. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of like how many rays? Do you have to do a thousand, or is ten enough, or three? What what kind of what what have you found? I think we assume the instant radiation is has a Gaussian distribution. So 
I can't remember how many angles do we integrate. I want to say 50. 50. 50. Yeah. Okay. Questions or comments? There's a very strong preference for sort of really the linear polarization or the perpendicular uh, plane. Uh, for that reason, uh, it's relative transfer calculation is, isn't that demanding. I guess the other question is, what would happen if the sun's surface was not just a uniform disk mm -hmm. from some point up in, mm -hmm. the, in the corona, if there's you know, a bright region and a dark region? Yeah, it would be the, more the complex. Unbalanced rays uh -huh. would mess up some of the symmetries. Yes, yes, it, it will be. It will be very complex if we consider the active region on the solar surface. So, yeah. It might be worth playing around with. Mm, different, yeah. Different, uh, yeah, there's already some work that including the uh, solar active region. And uh, there's also some result. Maybe we can consider that in the future. Yeah. There was this other, uh, these law and collaborators model, I think Sarah was involved in that, that had a magnetic field configuration that, that uh, was even a step more complicated. Uh, yes, it's the one that Annie's been working with, actually. Ah. Uh -huh, yeah, but it got more of a spermat. Yeah, and so you're working on that. Annie is working on that. Okay. For this study, something with much more simple, simply um, distinguishable line of sight and plane of sky fields was needed. So, in, in fact, yeah, I'm just curious. satellite was turning in a roll, and Nora Di Naralfi used that opportunity to turn SUMER, which was a spectroscopic instrument, into a spectrophorometer, and demonstrated, it took a measurement to demonstrate that there was a sensitivity to the Hanley effect in the ultraviolet lines, but, which is pretty cool. Is but, that correct? But SUMER didn't have pol polarimetry. Exactly. But the, the, grading, the grading actually oh, acts yeah. as a partial polarizer. Oh, that's cool. That's so that's why it was a cool okay. thing to take a nice serendipitous thing, but as, as to my knowledge, some, something like this has never flown, although it's been 